we've got here is nutrient cycling in the environment. And myself and Doug Collins are going to kind of tag team on this one. I'm going to start it off and then turn it over to Doug. And Doug, by the way, is an extension faculty with WSU Small Farms Program. He's a soils uh, extension specialist. And he um, is an active instructor in ecological soil management for beginning and advanced producers. And his research program is focused on mostly organic vegetable cropping system and managing and monitoring soil fertility. And he's going to kind of talk about the soily, soil part of this nutrient cycling environment. I want to set the stage for you and just let you know what we're going to be talking about here. And essentially, we've got four main areas where we can have some type of a loss in this system. And again, we're going to focus a lot on nitrogen here with some phosphorus and potassium discussion as well. But as I alluded to, nitrogen is the most squirrely, right? It can be in all four of these. We can have air, movement to air, groundwater, surface water, and to soil. And I'm going to address these top three after Doug talks about soil. Um, but what is the issue? Where does this come from? So it starts with, of course, manure deposition. And your cows produce a lot of manure. This is almost, milk is almost a byproduct of manure production on your farm. This is a guarantee. Every one of your animals is going to do this every day. You know it's going to happen. So you have a lot of manure. But it's also an awesome product, as I mentioned. It's free. It's probably the best fertilizer and soil amendment you can have. It's really good for your crops. It's just about utilizing it um, the best that you can. So understanding what is that agronomic rate. So that's matching up what does your crop need with what you're putting out there and what's already available in your soil. So that balance there. So we apply these nutrients to crops and hopefully you get great crop uptake and you don't have any access and it goes right back that green um, that you harvest is going right back into your system and you could have this awesome closed loop. This would be ideal. It's you know obviously in ideal. It's not 100% possible, but it's very close. But what we do have is, is we have excess nutrients, there's some sediment, there's some pathogen loss. There are some losses that occur. And they occur by into the soil, hopefully this one, if done right, you can hold it in the soil and get it back into your nutrients and crops and back into that system. So if we can do this right, we can actually hold it in the soil with good timing of application. We do get some loss to the air, to surface water, and to groundwater. And the whole point is to try to minimize these losses, to address um, all of our different, those four kind of four R's, if you will, to hit those just right so that we are minimizing these losses, to get your manure application schedule customized for your fields, to utilize the tools we've got available to help you figure that out on a field by field basis, and to look at what are these extra little things um, things like manure application setbacks, kind of insurance policy pieces that you can use to also help you limit any of these losses. So it's pretty, most of these are easy. It's going to be about timing. Um, here, if we look at this, it's going to be about timing, about placement, um, also about rate here. And then this one is going to take all that into um, account for your sources. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doug here to take it away on the soils part of things. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am going to talk just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Basically, a uh, little history or natural history of soils, how they how how they are formed. Um, then talk about soil health generally, and specifically how it's how it's affected by um, manure management. And then look specifically at some soil nutrient cycles, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So soils, um, we call the, we talk about five soil forming factors, which are um, parent material, climate, organisms, aspect, how you're facing on a hill slope, and time. So the interaction between these uh, five soil forming factors are what create a specific soil at a specific site. And of course, in um, this part of the country, this part of the world, 
glaciers have played a really important part in, in forming what we see here around uh, the specific soils and, and sort of shaping that geography. So during the Pleistocene uh, period, two to three million years ago, um, which ended about the last glacial maximum was about 10 to 12,000 years ago, so really not that long ago, um, glaciers covered most of the north one third of Washington state. And then as these glaciers receded, they left uh, residual um, glacial outwash and that combined with some volcanic activity in this area um, and then the rivers that, that sort of came through those areas is what the soils that, that we see were formed on. So this is what we call, um, this would be the parent material, the material that, that the soils began to form on. And then we have a very wet climate, of course, and, and a very sort of a pretty short amount of time, only 10 to 12,000 years ago. And then you're going to get local changes with aspect and then the different organisms that are there. And those are going to, those factors all combining together are going to form a, a, a soil, a very, the soil that you're standing on. And the most specific form of, of talking about soil is a series. And so uh, soil series, a lot of them have geographical names and this has to do with those five soil forming factors. You don't really get the same five factors that are going to combine exactly the same in any one area. So these soil series like um, Linden, uh, Kickerville, Laxton, Tromp, they tend to, to have names that, that you know, indicate where they are in space. But for example, a Puyallup soil, obviously you can find that down in the Puyallup area, but you can also find that up here because the conditions are, are similar enough. So once you know what soil series you have, you can really get a lot of information about your soil. There's about 20,000, uh, more than 20,000 soil series. So um, some good, you know, I imagine your nutrient management plan, if you can find that, would probably identify what soil you have. Some other good resources are the web soil survey. And then there's some apps for your um, smartphone. One I really like is Soil Web, and that will basically tell you um, it'll locate you on your phone and say you're standing on this particular soil. Um, when you look into that soil survey, it's going to talk about the horizon. Um, so every, every soil series is going to have a unique horizon. Um, the O horizon is something you find mostly in, in forested areas. That's going to be like that very organic, rich um, matter. Mostly what we're uh, concerned about in, in agriculture is the A and B horizon. The A is kind of the topsoil. And so this is going to be more dark than what's below it because of that input of organic matter over, over uh, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of years in some cases. So this is the topsoil, the A horizon. And then the B horizon tends to be a little more clay rich. So your soil series information is going to tell you um, about that, that soil and, and some things to think about in terms of management. So moving into um, healthy soil and quality soil, when we talk about um, soil quality, what we mean by that is the capacity of the soil to do something for us. And we ask a lot of our soils. So um, these are some of the functions that we expect soils to, to do, supply nutrients from organic sources, suppress root diseases, develop healthy root systems, uh, allow water and air to infiltrate easily, um, provide sufficient water to plants during dry cells, and be a, a space for beneficial organisms um, like mycorrhizal fungi. So do you have a quality soil or not? It depends. Is it doing what you want it to do? So think about in your own situation, you know, you want to be able to grow forage um, uh, to feed your animals, and uh, you know, there is also this idea that you want to be able to deal with your waste. So you know, you're asking the soil to to sort of hold on to those nutrients. So that's a function that we're interested in. Um, but usually in agriculture, you know, the, the function of soil we're, we're thinking about is, is good production of crops. So, you know, crops require all of these different things in order to, to be able to um, produce well. Another part of that definition, though, for quality soil is it's, you know, it's this capacity to provide the functions we want, but also not degrading the surrounding environment. So you can have a very fertile soil a very productive soil, but if that soil is also losing nutrients to the environment, then you, you, it's not a very quality soil. You can degrade uh, waterways around you, um, groundwater, and of course, um, the air quality too, as Nicole mentioned. So here we have, um, and I'll come back to this again, but you know, this is what we call eutrophication, so the over-enrichment of, of uh, water with nutrients, and, and we end up with 
um, al algae blooms and uh, degradation of water quality. And then also with soil quality, soils have both inherent and dynamic soil quality. So some of those properties that you'll find in when you read about your soil series are inherent soil, soil properties, like uh, soil texture, for example. So those are things that you can't easily change as a manager. That's sort of, that's why it's important to know what your soil series is. That's what you have. Um, the sand, silt, and clay, that, that is what you have to, to work with. Some other properties of soil um, can, be more, can be changed by um, management practices. So we call those dynamic soil quality properties. So some big ones there are or the organic matter content and fertility. Those are things that can be changed. Other things like drainage, you know, those can be changed, but not very easily. Um, so looking at specifically at soil texture, this is of course the particle size distribution. When you look at uh, just the, the mineral part of soil, not the organic matter, you can divide it up, that mineral part, by size. And um, sand is the biggest. Those, that's going to be um, something you can see in your hand, basically, if you look at an individual sand grain. Uh, the, we, up to two millimeters in size is what we consider sand. Anything over that we call gravel. So um, sand is the largest. Clay um, and silt, you're not going to be able to see without a microscope. Clay, you, you need a very special microscope to even see anything that small. So, um, clay is, is extremely small, silt is kind of in the middle up to um, 0.05 millimeters. So the distribution, all we're talking about here is, is the distribution of size particles uh, that, that determines the soil texture. And what you have is going to affect drainage, aeration, water retention, and nutrient exchange. In terms of nutrient exchange, it's all, it's all about clay. So soils that have more clay are going to be able to hold more nutrients. Soils that don't have a lot of clay are not are going to hold less nutrients. And then, of course, you can imagine how clay um, is going to affect uh, drainage. So sandier soils are going to drain much better. This is called the soil texture triangle. And um, just depending on, again, purely the percentage of uh, clay, silt, and sand puts you in a specific area. So when we talk about a loamy soil, it has nothing to do with organic matter. A lot of people think, oh, my, my soil is loamy. It's got you know, good organic matter. The all a loamy soil means is that it has the um, ideal combination of sand, silt, and clay for plant growth, basically. So you're in that sweet spot with a loamy soil because each of those, each of those components of soil texture provides something important for plants. So sand you know, helps with drainage and airflow into the soil. Clay, like I mentioned, is really important for nutrient exchange and also water holding. So when you get that right combination of, of sand, silt, and clay, we call that a loam. And so a lot of the agricultural soils tend to be loams or sandy loams, silt loams, you know, clay loams. Something in that area um, means that you've got a, a good combination of sand, silt, and clay. And again, this is what we call an inherent soil property, soil quality. So some soils you know, are going to be managed differently just because of, of the soil texture, because of these inherent properties. And there's not a lot you can do to, to change your soil texture. Okay, so organic matter, um, we talk a lot about organic matter today. It's, it's uh, important for many reasons. Um, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, Nicole already mentioned how the, you know, the manure and the organic matter plays into the uh, availability of nitrogen and other, other nutrients. Um, organic matter also affects the physical properties of soil, so it helps build soil structure. And the, um, what we're talking about with soil structure are aggregates, so is your soil well aggregated? That means like when you pick it up, you can see these um, what we call peds, like a, a stable structure in the soil at a, a, you know, a macroscopic level. And organic matter combined with clay and sand and the microbial activity helps to build this aggregation. And what aggregation allows, kind of imagine like marbles, you know, holding together. Water and air can pass through those, those pores in there. Um, with, with poorly aggregated soils, there's little room for water to, to get through and, and, and little room for air to get through. You know, this is different than clods. Clods are what happens when we till at the wrong time when the soil's too wet. That's not necessarily, you know, though you'll see nice big blocks that hold together, but those aren't, that's different than aggregation. Aggregation is more of a, a natural soil process. And so organic matter really helps with building aggregation and soil structure. Um, organic matter helps to do, um, 
helps with water retention and also um, infiltration, especially because of the uh, aggregation. And then organic matter is a slow release source of nutrients. And um, organic matter also can help with uh, nutrient exchange. So in sandy soils, the organic matter, the humus in the soil, provides some um, ability to hold on to nutrients in the soil, things like calcium, um, potassium, magnesium. And the, not, or, not all organic matter is the same. Um, if you look at sort of your volume of soil here, you know, you can see about half of the soil volume is composed of water and air. The other half is going to be some combination of that sand, silt, and clay. And then some very small amount is going to be organic matter. And within that organic matter, you can, the, the organic matter is going to have what we call older organic matter or soil humus. It's been decomposed a bit by microbial activity. And then some newer, what we call active organic matter. So this would be material that was applied more recently, things like manure or cover crops that were turned in. And so soils that have received a lot of, or, a lot of manure over the recent years are going to have a much higher amount of organic matter than soils, a much higher amount of active organic matter than soils that haven't. So this active organic matter is really where we're going to see that nitrogen coming through through a year, that mineralization process. And then a very small part of it is the living organisms, but as you'll see, um, they have a very important, disproportionate uh, importance, I think. And just, I, I already mentioned aggregation, but well aggregated soils allow um, water to infiltrate. Um, soils that don't have good aggregation, we're going to see more runoff. And so again, this is another, uh, just to reiterate that importance of organic matter. Okay, so moving now into fertility and some of the nutrients. These are um, all of the plant nutrients. And we have the macronutrients and the micronutrients. So the definition of a nutrient is it's required for plant growth. So there's no difference in terms of which is more important than the other in terms of macronutrients and micronutrients. They're all required for plant growth. So if one of these is missing, we're going to see some um, impact on plant growth. We spend, of course, the carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Most of what plants are made of are carbon and water. Um, these don't, we don't consider these soil nutrients because plants get the carbon, of course, from the atmosphere and, and water from uh, uh, rainfall, re root uptake. We spend a lot of time talking about nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium just because they occur in plants at larger amounts. And that's what, that's what we mean by a macronutrient. So they occur, occur in plants at larger amounts. Um, but it's in, but you know, don't forget that all of these other things, we're going to talk mostly about those today. But that's one of the beauties of manure, too, is it's bringing in a lot of these other nutrients um, as a source. So when you think about, you know, uh, Nicole mentioned this, the difference between manure and chemical fertilizers. Chemical fertilizers are going to basically focus on, you know, very specific nutrients. Manure is going to have more of a suite of, of uh, elements coming in to help uh, with plant growth. So not only um, does the nutrient have to be present for plants to be able to take it up, but it has to be in the right form. And plants take up nutrients as ions, which just means they're positively charged. And these are some examples of how uh, the forms of nutrients that plants will take up. So with nitrogen, plants are going to take up nitrogen, nitrate or ammonium. Potassium is taken up as the free ion. And then phosphorus is taken up as phosphate or orthophosphate. And so not only, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily, when we're looking at a fertility analysis, we're not concerned with what's the total amount of potassium in the soil, we're concerned with what's the available amount of potassium. Is it in the right form for plants to take up? And so in, in the soil uh, medium, there are these different pools where nutrients can be. Um, we, uh, a lot of nutrients, again, the biggest pool for a lot of nutrients are going to be that parent material. The, the rocks and minerals that soils are weathered from, those are made up of a lot of the same you know, calcium, potassium, um, sulfur are in those parent materials. But this, come, this happens over the, the chemical and physical weathering that, that allows these elements to come out of the rocks and minerals happens over long periods of times, long, long periods of times, ten, hundreds, thousands of years. So this is not really, um, although it's a very big source of nutrients, it's, not, it's something that, again, is more of an inherent property. 
So um, the material that's added in manure or, or uh, cover crops um, as organic matter, that is going to become available through mineralization. And this is going to happen over a season. Um, and not all of it is necessarily going to become available over one season. So over time, we're going to build up a store of, of organic matter. And then these other um, pools of nutrients in the soil are what we call exchangeable. And so these, um, primarily on the surface of clay particles, but also on the surface of humus, as I mentioned, there's room for um, mainly positively charged ions to hang out. So calcium, magnesium, potassium, those are going to be able to rest in, um, on the soil particles and become available. Um, so as plants take up what's actually available in the soil solution, as plants take this material up, if there's more available on these exchange sites, those will come back into solution. So you've got kind of an equilibrium between these two sources. And of course, we call that the um, cation exchange capacity, the total amount of positively charged ions um, on exchange sites. And soils have different cation exchange capacities. Um, clay soils are going to have the highest cation exchange capacity. And then sandy soils um, that have been, so sandy soils that have been amended with uh, organic matter, that's going to give them this dark color, are going to have more cation exchange capacity than, than uh, lighter colored sandy soils. And loams are kind of right there in the middle. In terms of what we're talking about today, this is probably mostly relevant to potassium the cation exchange capacity because um, you know, when nitrate is in the soil, it, it's a negatively charged ion. So there's, that's something important also to remember, I guess, um, why we do worry about nitrate so much is that most of the places in the soil for nutrients to hold on to are negatively charged. So clays have a negative charge. And same with um, organic matter, we'll have a little bit more positive and negative charge. But there's not a lot of capacity in the soil to hold on to other negatively charged ions. So nitrate is a negatively charged ion. It doesn't have a lot of place to bind in the soil. So if there's enough water to sort of flush it out, it's going to tend to move out. Whereas things like uh, potassium, calcium, Magnesium are not going to be lost as readily because, especially in soils that have higher cation exchange capacities. All right, so now I'm just going to kind of step through the um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, um, talk a little bit about the cycles of those nutrients in the soil, uh, their importance. Um, so nitrogen is um, accounts for most of the, uh, you know, one to six nitrogen. 1 to 6% of plants is nitrogen. So again, this is really high relative to all of the other, the other nutrients. And that's why we spend a lot of time worrying about nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most frequently deficient nutrient in uh, non-legume crops. Um, nitrogen is uh, the building block of amino acids um, or forms amino acids. And then that's what's used to make um, proteins. And of course, proteins are in every single structure of, of the plant. So it's incredibly important. Plants can't, can't do much without a, a good source of nitrogen. This is the soil nitrogen cycle looking primarily at what happens in the soil. Um, so a lot of 79% uh, of the atmosphere is, is this inert dinitrogen. And um, most, most plants can't do much with it. Uh, the exception is legumes, which have a um, mutualistic relationship with rhizobia. And so those bacteria in the legume nodules are able to do what we call fixed nitrogen and bring that into the uh, soil. And then when we turn that, um, say we have a nitrogen, uh, a, a leguminous cover crop, and we turn that in, this material becomes part of the soil organic matter. And then the same thing happens if we add um, some organic amendment like manure or compost. That becomes part of the soil organic matter. So the nitrate, the nitrogen that's in that soil organic matter is not readily available to plants. So it has to first um, go through a mineralization process, which means what we're talking about there is the bacteria and the fungi in the soil, the microbes, are trying to get at this carbon, and they also need nitrogen. So they are going to be digesting the carbon. They have the ability to break those bonds 
that hold uh, the organic matter, uh, the plant material, the manure together. So they are going to break those bonds. They're trying to build their bodies, get at that carbon. And then in the process, um, they're going to release a little bit of nitrogen, but it's really when they're digested by these secondary organisms, protozoa and nematodes, that we really see a lot of nitrogen being excreted. So that's, the microbial biomass is built from eating the, the carbon that we're putting into the soil. And then as there's turnover, um, digestion from the secondary uh, decomposers like nematodes, protozoa, some of these bigger organisms, <clears throat> then we see nitrogen excreted and actually becoming uh, available and available for plant uptake. And then plants can take that up. And so, you know, when, how is, it, how is uh, nitrogen then lost from this season? You know, if we have a, if we have a nice uh, tightly coupled system, then we sort of just keep everything like this. We have, all, we have a, available nitrogen, plants take it up, and everything's uh, hunky-dory. But when we have too much available nitrogen in the system, in the soil, more than the plants can take up at the time that they need it, then we start to see nitrogen leaching. So as I mentioned, you know, nitrate is going to be, um, doesn't have a lot of room to hang on in the soil. So if we have excess uh, water, it's going to go down the soil profile into that groundwater. And then we can also lose um, nitrogen uh, from nitrous oxide um, and denitrification. <coughs> And then ammonium, this, this line should really probably come over from the amendment. So uh, ammonia can also be lost. Um, and that, you know, that's a problem because, again, nitrogen is an important resource. We want to get it back into the plants. There's also odor issues. And it's estimated that as much as 70% of the total nitrogen that's in that manure can be lost as ammonia through manure handling. So getting that um, manure into the soil and then incorporated quickly is going to reduce that ammonia loss. Um, and then the other, you know, basically just trying to balance what plants can take up with what is going to be available um, is going to help reduce the nitrate leaching. And that's not an easy thing to do. Nicole mentioned a couple of problems with it, that seasonal timing. When the plants aren't growing um, when, when uh, it's available and, um, you know, the, we see the, the nitrogen mineralization really speeding up in the middle of the summer. So early in the season, there's not much speeding, not much happening, and then later in the year, it tends to speed up. So trying to match the timing between need and availability is, is a real problem. All right, I'm going to got about five more minutes left. So phosphorus again also uh, occurs at higher levels in the plants. Um, important for a lot of different um, plant operations. One thing about phosphorus is there's a narrow pH window for availability. Um, at low pH, phosphorus can be tied up uh, by precipitating with iron and aluminum compounds, and then at higher pH, um, precipitates with calcium. The phosphorus cycle actually looks pretty similar. You know, we don't have the uh, gas components of um, phosphorus, but you know, in terms of mineralization and available phosphorus, it's very similar. We're applying phosphorus. It's, it's, in the, uh, it's in the material. It's in the car. It's, it's bonded to the carbon, if you will. And so it's, it's in that organic matter. It has to go through a mineralization process to be available. Once it's in the soil, it can be absorbed, ad adsorbed um, in the soil, or it can be precipitated. You know, these are reversible processes. This one's a little less reversible than that one. So you know, when we get some phosphorus absor absorption, it can come back out. Um, there can be phosphorus leaching when you get very high levels of phosphorus in your soil above 80 parts per million, then you can start to see some phosphorus leaching. But in general, phosphorus is primarily going to be lost um, through with soil particles. And so when we're adding a lot of manure, when we're building, um, when we're building phosphorus in the soil, um, there's risk that you know any any soil material that's lost is going to be carrying with it phosphorus. And that, um, that creates a major water quality issue with eutrophication. So phosphorus can be lost through both point sources and non-point sources. Um, what that means, if, you know, and, and, and um, what Sherry described with the nutrient management plan, it sounds like you know, when, when the inspector comes, they're really looking at these. These are going to be the, the point sources are things where you can see manure basically going into the waterway. And those are going to be the ones that are I guess easier to really identify and, and, and put a handle on. The non-point sources, this is what happens when the, 
the manure, this is where all that soil testing comes in. How much did you apply? How much is in your soil? You know, that's all designed to really limit the non-point source uh, pollution, which is that loss of soil. Not loss of manure directly, but loss of soil that's been enriched with phosphorus. Or loss of phosphorus um, through, through leaching, which can happen in, in, you know, when you get to very high levels of phosphorus in the soil. So just to touch on eutrophication again, eutrophication is the reaction in water to the over-enrichment of nutrients. It's a quote I really like from Aldo Leopold, the color of our streams is a measure of how we treat the land. So if the, what we're looking at a picture of here are um, called cyanobacteria. And the unique thing about cyanobacteria, they're kind of like those legumes, like the rhizobia and legumes. They can also fix nitrogen. So these are free living nitrogen fixers. And so that nitrogen is not going to be a limiting thing for them. Phosphorus is. Phosphorus is going to be the limiting nutrient for these, for these guys, these um, cyanobacteria, these blue-green algae that live in waterways. So when they get a lot of phosphorus, they're, that's what's going to limit their growth and they're going to take off. When they die, they consume oxygen, kills fish. Um, it's a big problem. So that's why we, we worry about uh, phosphorus. Um, moving on to potassium. Um, potassium is not part, it's not bonded to carbon the same way um, nitrogen and phosphorus are. It's, it's important to sell, it's important to plants, it's used in osmoregulation, meaning that, um, you know, keeping that, that balance of positive and negatively charged ions within the, within the plant cell. So um, plants need a lot of potassium. If they don't, you know, if you, if you don't have enough potassium, you'll see um, reduced growth. And... Um, but it's not, it's not the same thing where it's, it's, it's not part of those protein structures like, like nitrogen is. So the potassium uh, cycle in soil looks a lot different. We're not so concerned about mineralization. We can add potassium. You know, potassium's coming in either with fertilizer. Um, we're getting some with manures, but it's, it's, it's in the solution of the manure or it's absorbed in manure particles. And then it becomes part of the soil solution phosphorus. We can get some leaching. Um, that's going to depend, you know, a large part on the uh, um, cation exchange capacity. It's not an environmental hazard to, to see potassium leaching. Um, the, the problem, and I'm not an expert on this, but when you get too much potassium, it, get, it accumulates in the plants, and then you can get, um, you, you can disturb the uh, ion balance of, of the, uh, or the nutrient balance of the, of the plants, which can also affect the animals that eat it. So, it, it can build up in soil um, because, you know, again, it's, it's not lost as, as, as readily as nitrate. And it can also find lots of places to absorb in the soil. Um, this, is that, uh, this is what we're talking about with the problem with potassium, luxury potassium consumption. So you can see as um, the, the potassium content of, of plants let's see, the relative growth of plants. So, so plants will grow as potassium increases Plants will grow up to a certain point, but then at, at a certain level of potassium, we're not seeing any more plant growth, but we do see an increase, we see more of an increase in the potassium concentration of plants. So the plant growth, the amount of biomass that we're getting doesn't really increase, but the concentration of potassium in the plants will continue to increase, increase if there's more potassium available in the soil. So that's what we mean by luxury consumption. So just some concluding thoughts. I would definitely um, reiterate that that point that Nicole made that manure is a very valuable resource. Um, we can have too much of a good thing, especially when we get nutrient losses. So we need to adopt practices that are going to mitigate losses. Mineralization is very tricky. Um, and Andy's going to talk more about, more about this later in terms of the agronomic use of manure and how to try to deal with that. But you know, he's going to talk about those, uh, I think, some manure characteristics that affect how, how much mineralization you can expect to get. It's going to depend on um, the characteristics of the manure and then also temperature and moisture because these are biological processes. And what else? One thing. So, again, just to reiterate, we're expecting a lot of our soils. We want it to act as a buffer to absorb manure components and hold them in the root zone to prevent movement to adjacent environments. Um, you know, keeping track of, of managing basically to help the soil do its do its function is is what we need need to think about. All right. Yeah.
So let's kind of keep moving through. We, we just kind of addressed the soil part of uh, this process. And now I want to talk somewhat about the surface water component. Let's um, kind of go to that. And, and just to um, kind of put this in context, yes, we're talking about manure, but there are a handful of different um, things that we are worried about with agricultural-based potential pollutants. And those are chemical pollutants such as herbicides and pesticides, um, chemical-based fertilizers, as well as sediment from soil erosion uh, is also another big one. We see a lot of problems with this in, I'm sure you have drainage maintenance, maintenance concerns that occur. So um, not only does it act as a pollutant, but it's also kind of a pain in your butt sometimes too to have these things. Uh, of course the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus would be our nutrient. And then we have got the pathogen fecal coliform um, in bacterial concern. So we do have different types of pollutants. When we're talking about manure, of course, we're mostly going to address this nutrient and pathogen pathways uh, that are of most concern. And why is runoff a problem? Doug kind of mentioned a few of these things already um, about the eutrophication and what that is. We don't see a ton of that, but we do see it, especially in low flow water bodies, uh, water bodies that do get a lot of nutrients in it. When they warm up, you're going to see those blooms. And that's just a problem from aquatic uh, species that are present in that water body. And we don't see it. You may hear a lot about this on the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico areas where you get these huge green turns that's phosphorus based for the most part. We don't see that as much, but it doesn't mean it's not happening a little bit can actually make a difference. So something we don't maybe see, but we are still concerned about. More important would be turbidity. So when we get all that sediment into those water bodies, the water becomes really turbid. And this can be an issue for fish, particularly for salmon migration. So they um, will typically stay out of water bodies for two reasons. The first one is temperature, is the first thing that kind of keeps them away from areas if the water's too warm. They won't go in that water body and spawn. And the other one is turbidity. If they can't see to navigate, they won't go up a water body. So those are kind of the two big things um, when we think about runoff being a problem. Uh, additionally, kind of low oxygen and toxicity when we get nutrients into those waters and they're taking up oxygen in order to convert and create these algaes and everything else, that low oxygen, again, those aquatic life forms are gonna have a, a bit struggle to keep kind of alive and or fish will go in that area, et cetera. So that's kind of one reason for the nutrients in particular, as well as some of the sediment issues, why we definitely wanna keep that stuff out of our water bodies. Um, Again, this affects the freshwater fish in particular when we think about that. The shellfish beds, everybody knows about. <laughs> um, in particular with them, that's more the fecal coliform pollution. So anytime there's a bacterial charge into the water, particularly they measure fecal coliform. I'm going to show you a slide about this. Um, and that is kind of their indicator for having issues since shellfish are filter feeders. They're doing their job by taking in that stuff and getting it out of the water body. Unfortunately, people also like to eat shellfish and they don't want to eat fecal coliform as it can be toxic to humans. So that's why it's a concern in that respect. And then wetlands and wildlife and other resources can also be impacted by sediments and nutrients and pathogens if those things happen to get into water bodies. And lastly, it's human concern and recreational uh, waterways. So when there is a high fecal count or something of that nature, whether that can come from many different sources, as we'll discuss, that is a problem for folks who want to swim in the river, who want to stand in there and fish and whatever. So these are kind of the reasons why surface water runoff is even on the radar. So it is a problem from aquatic fish, from human consumption, for, for human recreation, all those things um, are important. And so where do these pollutants come from? Most of the stuff is pretty darn obvious and I've mentioned it, of course. Um, our chemicals is our herbicides and pesticides and sediment is soil erosion as well as manure. So you know if you put manure on your, on your field and it's really high, let's say in solids or you're putting solid manure out, that if it runs off is kind of like a soil in some respects. It's just like a sediment laden um, kind of runoff piece. So that's why it's kind of linked in with soil erosion. Uh, manure and fertilizer for the nutrients and the pathogens could be 
so many different things. Manure, livestock, septic, wildlife, dogs, wastewater, treatment plants. And when we look at a higher caliber of pathogens, this can go to things like waterlogged wood and um, some of these other wood products that we're now seeing can be a contributor to that. So there's many different sources here, depending on what you're going to measure. And I'll show you a slide here in a minute. Uh, so we've got <coughs> deposition, rainwater, forests, wetlands, uh, all of these things contribute to uh, many of these, especially the nutrient and pathogen categories. Uh, forest uh, logging will contribute to sediment. You've got sediments coming off of glacial melt. There's so many different factors, it's really hard to know what's what. But it's important for you to know what is your potential contribution to this, so you can be aware of that and note that um, and work on that when it's necessary to do so. So as I mentioned, our primary indicator is fecal coliform. I'm going to spend a couple slides on this because that's a, a big reason why there is so much concern about manure. And we're talking about manure here today as our focus. Manure has fecal coliform in it, obviously, right? And it's got a lot of these other great benefits. But this is the bad thing. And this is what is monitored in Whatcom County and other areas primarily. So if you're maybe not aware of it, there is uh, like monitoring that goes around all of Whatcom County at different places. There are point monitoring. When you've got Department of Ecology or Department of Ag going out and doing water samplers, they're looking for fecal coliform. As we mentioned, yes, that can be from a lot of different sources. So you take a scoop out of the river, that does not mean that's just dairy. It could be a lot of different things. Unfortunately, some of the cons with fecal coliform are that, and that you don't get immediate results. It takes a little while for to get those results back. You can't get them right in the field. You've got to colonize these. It has to be a lab procedure. You have to be qualified to do these analyses. And then they can't necessarily differentiate that source type. So you're not positive if it is cattle manure or if it's wastewater or if you had a beaver that pooped in the river right there when you took the sample. So there can be a, swans, you see them all over. And, and it can be, as I mentioned, in some of our peat fields, if you've got waterlogged wood under there, that's starting to degrade and puts out Klebsiella. And so you've got these other things that can show up in that signature fecal coliform. So it's a bit of a challenge, but you can still sort of use fecal coliform if you can bracket it in a stream and you can kind of work, you can find <coughs> here's a potential source. Oh look, there's a tile, let's follow that back. Was the tile packed with wood or is it, did I apply manure and that's where it's coming from? Or yes, here's a direct channel. So it's used more as an indicator to try to find where you may have a problem and then start working backwards onto that land base. So it's pretty obvious if you've applied manure and you had a big rain and you have a discharge, most of the time you can visually see those things and it's going to be pretty obvious. You don't need this to show you. But you can use fecal coliform for these larger sampling areas as just a, hey, we've got some high levels happening. I'm just going to do a little bit of a self-assessment here. Am I part of my watershed issue? Or you're like, man, neighbor so-and-so, that guy does nuts, he does this, he applied the wrong time, whatever it is. Maybe just go say, hey, I'm as much as a player and this is you. Let's have a discussion about this, which is always awkward, but hey, you can try that method. So there are some various things. Um, and you also have um, dilution effects and, and variable in-stream results. And fecal coliform can actually recolonize in some cases. So there isn't a lot of research on this. But in some areas where, let's say, you have a um, kind of annual stream where it doesn't flow all the time, but you've had it's kind of dry, maybe some manure got in there in some way, and that it'll kind of just stay there when the water starts running again it may pick that up and take it down it doesn't mean that you had that manure application at the time when that water started flowing it may have happened months earlier so some of these things can also be a little bit of a challenge but if you know these things and you're aware of everything that's going on on your land and your fields you can kind of defend yourself with some of this information and knowledge and be a little bit more perceptive or take your own water quality samples even more so. We'll have a conversation about that this afternoon about sampling, about you can start doing your own work to say, hey, I'm doing this, I know my practices are good, here are my samples to correlate with yours. So there's always those things that you can do um, for yourself. 
So as I mentioned, I just wanted to show you this because I think there's a little bit of confusion and conversation about this that happens about what the heck are they measuring and I've heard about this and that and the other. Just a real brief kind of uh, trying to diagram this. There are total coliform bacteria, which are human, animal, soil, wildlife, submerged wood, etc. Many, many things contribute to total coliform bacteria. This is not a good indicator of manure based. Um, in any way, you can be a fraction of it, you can be the whole thing, who knows. And then from here, fecal coliform bacteria is one of the total coliform bacteria. So fecal coliform, now we're getting to more fecal base, so this could be human or animal, still you can't differentiate. Um, this can also, by the way, be some of this um, kind of more wood products, sub submerged wood, pulp, etc. And then from fecal coliform, three of the main things in there, we've got Klebsiella, E. coli, and fecal streptococci. So these are the three pieces in here that you could break down even further. And this Klebsiella, this is going to kind of pull out some of that more wood-based product is uh, what this is going to get to. The E. coli, that's going to be a little bit closer to looking at, yes, this was probably, you know, kind of wastewater treatment plant or for animals. So now you're looking at actually gut. So it's a little bit closer. And then fecal streptococci, and, and you can even go one more step to enterococci. And this is probably even going to be more accurate on kind of starting to bracket that down. Uh, these all get very expensive as you go through, which is why they just typically do the one to try to capture as many sources as possible. But as you go forth uh, and start breaking this down, you can get a bit more accurate about where's the source coming from. There are things you've probably heard of, like DNA testing and these other kind of ways to break that down. Unfortunately, those methods are very expensive and they're not quite accurate yet. You actually have to build up a library, if you will, of sources in an area. You have to go and get a sample from a horse, from a cow, you know, et cetera, and then kind of know that signature of DNA. And then when you get your sample, and, and even those are gonna be a little different, so you have to have 10 different horses, et cetera. So that methodology, it's coming, but it's not quite here yet. It'll be nice when that does come around, that it'll be a little bit easier to say this is human, this is wildlife, this is cattle. So eventually that'll be, but for now it's this. And, and so I bring this up just to say that if you have a lot of question about this, that's totally valid. So the best way to kind of say, you know, was it me for reals is just to know what did you do on your land. So just have good manure application practices. Be aware of if you had a discharge and then work within that balance. So if you see a high count, just say, hey, did I have an issue? Check your land surfaces. It'll be a little bit more accurate for you to know your contribution to the issue. So let's move to groundwater. This is also an issue, this one's a little bit more nebulous as was mentioned because you can't see it. You have no idea visually if you're having an issue or what your problem is. It's even hard to do these calculations as Doug mentioned. Those soil properties is, you know, it's very confusing of when the stuff is going and how it's going. And so the best you can do is kind of just work to kind of understand what it is and when you have, you could have the biggest issues and work on minimizing that. So this is Department of Ecology um, 2012. This is their best um, guess and or relative inventory of <laughs> what are the sources. And you can see that this is manure and it gets 65% of the guess on that. So they're assuming that manure, fertilizer, so any nitrogen applied to land surface, they're assuming a large portion of that is lost as nitrate to groundwater. And it happens pretty easy, as, we, as I kind of alluded to earlier, any nitrogen that you apply that's in excess that can't be taken up by crops, it, it is gonna be lost. Uh, we get a lot of rain, and a lot of our soil types are like sandy, well-drained, that great permeability that you really want because you're like, great, I can get out there and all that. That just means water goes through pretty quick. So it's going to be able to kind of leach that stuff out very easily. So those are the soils that we really want to be vigilant that we're not applying too late in the season to get those losses. We just shift our schedule. And I'm going to show you that um, in the slide this afternoon about how we can kind of work with that. And then we've got some of our heavier soil types, so we're not going to see this leaching as importantly at that time of year 
Uh, we may see it more during irrigation effects, even in the middle of the summer, et cetera. So there are a lot of things. And of course, livestock is not the only source. You have um, leaking septics, natural systems. It just occurs, right? If there's nitrogen, it can be lost. So there are a lot of different sources. But um, it is fair to say that fertilizers and manure, if they're ill-applied, are contributing. How much is hard to know. So, and as I mentioned, uh, when they talk about leaching, this is, this is a nitrate issue for the most part, and folks are most concerned about this because its contribution um, to um, nutrients in groundwater. So this is a drinking, if it's above 10 parts per million, that's kind of the drinking standard above that. It is, EPA says it's not safe to drink. It could have human health effects, blue baby syndrome, et cetera. So folks are just naturally concerned. A lot of people are on wells in Whatcom County, as in other wa wa uh, Western Washington areas. So you are kind of pulling that up, and you may or may not have those um, high numbers. You can filter these things. That's totally possible, but this is why it's a concern. So for drinking water, for your animal stock water, for irrigation, if you've got let's say a high uh, nitrates in your irrigation water and you're irrigating, you may want to account for that in your nutrient budget. That's nitrogen you're applying, you're probably not even thinking of and you're trying to do your balance maybe at the end of the year and wondering why you have all this excess and now I've got, you know, it's kind of, you've got this leaching cycle that happens if you're not accounting for that. If you have 70 parts per million, let's say, in your water and that reapplies. So something just to consider, just to be um, relatively aware about um, some of the hard part about that, of course, is that yes, they can measure nitrate in water, but they can't say where it comes from. There's no way to do that. So yes, maybe they can kind of do what's called isotopic markers. Very expensive, not that accurate. You already have to have those things labeled. So knowing where this groundwater nitrate comes from, it, it's not going to happen. So a lot of this, this is, if you've ever heard of these kind of like broader inventories where they basically say, well, we think this much nitrogen was applied and we're going to assume you know, half of that's lost. That's how they figure these things out when they do those inventories. And that's not very accurate. If you're a good producer and you're working on, you know, right, and you're working on, you know, minimizing all these and matching things up, your, your losses can be pretty darn low. It's never going to be zero. That's absolutely impossible. Um, but it can be very, very low. <coughs> So that's also important um, and not taken into consideration. That's not necessarily always fair. And then the last uh, kind of piece I want to talk about is this air emission piece. And there are a lot of things that can be um, emitted or lost, uh, volatilized, if you will, from agricultural operations. One thing that we are very lucky about here on the west side is that it rains a lot. We're also very unlucky that it rains a lot. It's kind of a you know, catch 22 with that. But it means that it really does clean our air out a lot. So the time, the only time you'll probably really notice like, huh, we kind of have an air issue maybe, is when we get like kind of winter inversions where you kind of have this cold air that sinks down to the ground. You get warm air above that and it almost acts as like a ceiling. And so this air down here, a lot of that's from wood smoke, but you'll start seeing that kind of haze that forms. And a big chunk of that actually comes from ammonia, which is probably one of our bigger uh, emitters from agriculture. So agriculture, or I can just say kind of quickly, ammonia, without doing too much chemistry, why we're concerned about it is it's a basic gas. There's very few of those. Most of them are more acidic species. And we kind of, uh, Doug kind of talked about this with uh, soil chemistry as well. It happens in the air too. And so ammonia being basic, reacts with acidic species really easily. And what that forms is something called PM 2.5, which is haze. So that's all you need to know about all of that, is that ammonia can lead to smog, um, essentially. And that's what we see is kind of that. You'll see uh, very obviously up the Fraser, you'll see that kind of brown, kind of smog that kind of hangs out. And I was noticing that kind of this last week up in Vancouver and across kind of the Fraser. It's pretty obvious when that happens. But agriculture is the largest source of atmospheric ammonia because of the sources that are there, because of this nitrogen that's put out. We use a lot of it. It can volatilize from many different places. So it can be up to 70% um, of the total budget. 
It doesn't mean that it has to be, it just means it can be. Again, good producer doesn't have to be. So you've got two ways that it's produced. You can get it directly from your livestock. So animals urinate, um, and when this product called urea, which you're probably familiar with, milk urea, et cetera, there's urea in uh, their urine. And it will combine with urease, which is an enzyme in soil and feces, is everywhere. You can't really eliminate that. These two things combine, and one of the products of that is ammonia gas. So that's one way you get it directly from your barns, from parlors, etc. The what isn't volatilized directly makes it to your lagoon, and it pretty much holds there because this process likes oxygen, and your lagoon doesn't really have much oxygen. That's more of an anaerobic or non-oxygenated process. And so it waits, and then when you land apply, you're going to get more of that potential for that volatilization to occur. If you're using a big gun, you can get up to 70%, you know, 50 to 70% losses. It's much greater because you're increasing the surface area of all that manure to be lost as ammonia. People used to do this as a positive thing. They used to say, well, great, I'll use big guns. I'm blowing all that nitrogen into the air, so I'm not applying it to my field, so I don't have nitrogen leaching issues. Well, that's great. But then you drive air quality scientists like me crazy. It's like, no, no, don't do that. So now we're somewhere in the middle trying to balance all this. In your case, I mean, you really want to preserve that nitrogen. You want to maximize that nutrient value. I realize a lot of you want the opposite. You've got more manure than you've got land, but let's just pretend that we're all applying at perfect agronomic rates and we want to conserve nitrogen. So applying um, you know, with a technology that gets manure as close to the ground as possible and or you can incorporate it. Let's say you get a little bit of rain, a tenth of an inch right after application on soils that can take it, awesome. Uh, we don't really you know, incorporate or till our manure into our forage fields, but you certainly do with your corn. If you can get that out and then get it right into the soil, your loss rates are very low. If you're injecting it, maybe you know, you've got a 5% loss, it's very little. So the more, the closer you can get your manure to the surface under that grass canopy, or, you know, be able to harrow it in if that's a practice you have, or kind of get a little bit of rain or irrigation water right on that, you're gonna conserve a lot of that nitrogen and minimize your volatilization. So that's a, that's a very good thing. And then uh, the last one is dust, is the other big concern isn't a huge concern again on the west side very small time period do we have a concern about dust so this what i talked about this pm 2.5 the smog which is part of that ammonia production is probably the more important part of that and these particles you know the larger ones you this is more of an east side issue right where it's really dry and you get these dust storms we get very little of that if anything if you are having a dry period and you've got road dust or those types of things, you're just maybe disturbing a neighbor or thing nearby. So it's just nice as a courtesy thing um, to work on keeping some of those dust issues down. If you're applying solid manures though, this may be a little bit more of an issue. Try to apply it when it's a little bit wetter. Don't let that stuff dry out too much before application. Again, this isn't usually a big issue. Um, but in that case, we can really be able to make sure that it stays on the surface and that it isn't getting airborne and traveling. So that's another kind of concern from an air quality standpoint that maybe neighbors or folks near my, it's usually odor and dust that people can see and smell and are offended by and or it's the perception of an issue. So that's a big concern with maybe advocates or folks who don't want manure around them. It's because they think if they can smell it, that they're also breathing something bad. That isn't necessarily the case. So that's something kind of to work against as well. But if you can limit those things, then you don't have to approach those kind of ag urban interface issues. Again, in our area, it's not as big of a problem. But as you get more and more folks from outside moving in who don't know about ag, who you know, buy that house out in the country because they want this bucolic life and then someone applies manure next door that's been going on for 80 years, you know, they kind of get up in arms about it. So, you know, just be aware of these issues as time goes on that there are things you can do to limit any of those issues. Don't 
apply when the you know mile per hour wind is up over 10, for instance, especially with a big gun. You're going to get drift. That's a really big problem. You can apply when uh, in the morning or when it's cooler. You're not going to have as much volatilization and odor issues. Also, a positive thing for the air quality part. So. There are definitely many things that you can do with those little pieces.